Please take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, Old Testament book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then Numbers, fourth book of the Bible, Numbers chapter 13, if you would please, Numbers 13. We're going to read the last eight verses of this chapter, verses 25 through 33. Numbers 13 and verses 25 through 33. We'll read these verses responsibly as we usually do. We'll begin together on 25 and I'll read 26 and we'll alternate like that till we end together on verse 33 of Numbers chapter 13. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word and let's begin together on verse 25 of Numbers 13. Ready? And they return from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. And said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this evening. And we're asking you, Lord, that you would minister to our hearts tonight. Thank you for the music this evening, and thank you for the wonderful testimonies tonight from the people of God. And Lord, we're asking you to minister to us now through your word. So bless the special and prepare our hearts so we'll be ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleep. Thy presence, my light, be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father, and I thy true. nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure 
Lord, thank you now for this evening, and thank you, Lord, for just the privilege that's ours to serve you. We realize, God, that without you, we can do nothing. Lord, we're giving you the praise and the glory for what we were able to see yesterday is from the weather to the receptions of the people to the spirit of the people here in this place, and their willingness to serve and to love people because they love God. And Lord, thank you for the privilege and the honor it is to pastor such a people as this. And Lord, I pray that you will minister to our hearts now tonight. I'm, I'm very well aware that people are tired. And Lord, they're uh, wanting to get some extra rest and I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to bring across the truth this evening and uh, be able to say what needs to be said and leave undone what doesn't need to be said. And, Lord, I pray that you would minister to our hearts tonight and encourage folks in the Lord this evening. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If your Bible's open back to Numbers 13 again, you are reminded that the children of Israel have come up to the edge of the promised land. And uh, they have sent in 12 spies to spy out the land. You're familiar with the story. Ten of those spies came back and and said, there's no way we can take it. There's giants there. And uh, the uh, Anakims and the, the, the Amalekites, and they list all the ites that are there and all the reasons why they can't take it. Two men... Joshua and Caleb saw things differently, didn't they? And in fact, jo- uh, Caleb interrupted him at one point and said, hey, let's go take it right now. Uh, God's able to give it to us. We're able to overcome it. Let's take it right now. Uh, Twelve people, ten of them looking at one thing and, and saw something different than two people that saw something different. And the difference in what they saw was who they were looking at. Who were they looking at? Whom they were looking at. Maybe that's proper English. Are you really amening proper English? Amen. <laughs> David and Goliath. Other, you remember the story David was sent with food and supplies just to check on his brothers by his father. And when he got there, he heard Goliath defying the God of Israel and defying the armies of the Lord God of Israel. And all of he was challenging them to give me a man to fight me. And the challenge was, I'll fight anybody you have, and if I win, you're going to be our servants, and if you win, we'll be your servants. And not a one of the trained soldiers in Israel, including King Saul himself, would accept the challenge. But a shepherd boy shows up with just food for his brothers, and he said, Somebody ought to knock that guy's block off. Now, that's deep in the Hebrew. You've got to dig deep to get that, but it's there. What was the difference? What was the difference between what they were looking at and what David was looking at? The difference had to be into whom they were looking. I believe success or failure in your Christian life depends largely upon where you are looking. Where are you looking? I want you to get two New Testament scriptures with me right now. I want you to get Romans chapter 8 and have that with a finger in it if you would. Romans 8 and then get pick up 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Romans 8 and then 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
just put a piece of paper or something in 2 Corinthians. We'll go there second and we'll look at Romans 8 right first and then we'll go to 2 Corinthians 3 second. All right? Romans 8, most of you are very familiar with verse number 28 where the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His, to his purpose. Now verse 29 tells us His purpose. Romans 8.29, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate, or predetermine, to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God has predetermined that those of us who He knows be conformed to the image of His Son, who is Jesus Christ. That is, that is God's purpose for you and me. Now I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and look with me at verse 18, would you please? The Bible says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'll submit to you tonight, success in the Christian life. You say, well, how can I know if I'm a success in the Christian life? How can I know if I'm succeeding in the Christian life? Let me define success as a Christian. It is being like Jesus Christ. It is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. As I am like Jesus Christ in my attitudes, in my actions, in the way I conduct my life, Allowing Christ to live through me, that is a successful Christian. To the degree that I am not like Christ and I yield to the flesh and I yield to what I want and what I think and what I feel, I fail in the Christian life. The fact that I I do not represent Christ and I do not allow Him to be seen through me, that is failure. And so we want to understand success in the Christian life is being like Jesus Christ. The songwriter said, Oh, to be like Thee. Oh, to be like Thee. Precious Redeemer, pure as Thou art. Come in Thy fullness. Come in Thy sweetness. Stamp Thine own image deep on my heart. That we might be like Jesus Christ. Earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the house and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. I don't know about you, that beats any kind of songs being written today. But I'll tell you that for sure. So if I'm going to, listen, if we're going to live right, if I'm going to live right, I have to keep looking right. If I don't look to the right person, I will not live the right kind of Christian life. Hebrews 12.2, as the Bible says, we're running with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12.2 says we're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As we run the race, we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's where we're to look to. When we fail that, we yield to the flesh, we get our eyes off Christ, and we begin to fail as a Christian. Now briefly, I just want to share three thoughts with you. Number one is oftentimes, what we do is we look inward at ourselves. We look inward at ourselves. I want you to go with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19, if you would please. The devil does not care where else we look, just so we do not look to Jesus Christ. The devil devil doesn't have a will other than you don't do God's will. It's, It's anything else but what God wants. And so he'll try to get us to look other places. And the first place that oftentimes people look is we're looking at ourselves. And look what happened to Elijah in chapter 19. Chapter 18 has been a great victory. Defeats the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And, and called fire down from heaven. Then the cloud came and the rains have come. 
but Elijah is running away from Jezebel. And in 1 Kings 19.4 it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Look down at verse 10. The Lord and, and Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 14. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenants, thy covenant, and thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Ask you a question Who's Elijah focusing on? <laughs> Himself. I'm the only one. Just me, Lord, and everybody else has gone off track. Everybody else is wrong. It's like Grandpa who went to sleep, and while he was sleeping, his kids put Limburger cheese in his beard. When Grandpa woke up, he said, man, this room stinks. And then he started walking around the house, and he said, no, this house stinks. And when he went outside, he said, no, the whole world stinks. Well, it wasn't the world, it wasn't the house, it wasn't the room, it was Grandpa. And when we focus on ourselves, we're going to get depressed. Paul wrote in Romans 7, you remember the struggle he had about what was going on inside of him? You know what Paul said in Romans 7? He basically said this, the things I know I ought to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. And he comes to the conclusion saying, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Man, it's such a struggle and it's such, and I get defeated and I don't see anything good in me at all. And as long as he looked inward, and you read Romans chapter 7, and you circle how many times the word I is used in Romans 7. It's incredible the amount of times that Paul says I, 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 I. And when you get to Romans 8, that tremendous chapter that opens with no condemnation and ends with no separation, it's spirit, 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 spirit. You rarely see an I in Romans chapter 8. It all depends on where you're looking. Now I understand tonight, everybody in this room is a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all, that all means us. You say, well preacher, I've just blown it. Well join the club. We've all blown it at some time or another. You have to understand that, that each of us have broken promises. Everybody here in this room at some point in your life have brought disappointment to somebody else. You've let somebody else down. And if you just look at yourself, you're going to get pretty depressed. If it could happen to Elijah, I suppose it could happen to us. If all you do is introspection, it'll surely happen to you. Now i got news for you. God loves you. God knows all about you and He still loves you. Because God's love to you and God's love to me is not based on how we do. His love is not based on any kind of performance by us. He loves us because of who He is. We're valuable to Him because of who He is. And we are valuable to God. We say this morning, he's, listen, man is who Christ died for. God loves man above every other of His created beings. Somebody passed something on to me. I'm going to share it with you. It was a, a well-known speaker started off his seminar by holding up a $20 bill. He asked the room of people he was speaking to who would like this $20 bill. Hands started going up. I thought about doing it, but Brother Lindemann hasn't come through with his 10000 to me yet, so I'm waiting. <laughs> Was it ten thousand or hundred thousand? It's a hundred thousand. Okay, thank you. I don't take checks, by the way, brother Chuck. And 
So he said, well, wait a minute, let me do this first. And he took that $20 bill and he crumbled it up. He said, okay, now who wants a $20 bill? Guess what? They still put their hand up. Said they still wanted it. He said, no, no. He said, wait a minute. What if I do this? And he took that $20 bill and he put it on the floor and he How many of you still want it? Yeah. Everybody still put their hand up. They still wanted that $20 bill. Because you know what? No matter if it was crumpled, no matter if it was dirty, it still had value. It was still good. It was still a value. It never decreased in value no matter what happened to it. Dropped, crumpled, ground into the dirt. It doesn't matter how many times you've been crumbled. Does not matter how many times you've been ground into the dirt even by your own mistakes and your own bad choices? You're still of value to God. You never lose your value to Him. You're important to Him. Dirty or clean, crumpled or finely creased, you're still valuable to God. Amen? The worth of our lives doesn't come in what we know or what we're able to do, but because of whose we are. We belong to Him. We love Him because He first loved us. So, the devil would love to get us to just look at ourselves because when we're looking at ourselves, we're not looking at Christ. So, sometimes we look at ourselves. Number two, sometimes we look outwardly to others. Outwardly to others. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, would you please? 2 Corinthians and chapter 10. The church at Corinth were, were, were having a problem. And in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, look with me at verse number 12. The Bible says here, Paul says, We dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Verse 18, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. The, the members at Corinth, and by the way, a, a, a carnal church, a baby church, they were comparing themselves to each other. They weren't, and listen, trying to compare each self. I'm, in other words, I try to measure myself by you. Or you try to measure yourself by another church member. But don't forget what the goal is. What's the goal of the Christian life? To be like Christ. To be Christ-like. So why am I trying to be better than somebody else? Why, why am I trying to do more than somebody else? Why am I jealous about what someone else may get to do? I'm just trying to be like Jesus. I'm striving to be like Christ. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing or what anyone else is not doing. It matters what I'm doing for Christ. There's no need for comparison. When they came back from battle and the people started singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens thousands. Boy, that, that went over well, didn't it? That never caused any problem anywhere, did it? No, when they started comparing the two, that brought an unrest and a havoc throughout the, the, throughout the nation of Israel and especially in the palace where Saul lived. David and his men returned from to Ziklag, their city, only to find it burned and their wives and children taken captive. It was a difficult time. And the men, you know what the men talked? David's mighty men. You know what they talked about doing? Stoning David. They were going to kill him. It's your fault that we weren't here. It's your fault we got attacked. 
and our kid, wives and children are gone. David, if he was looking for approval from others, he's in trouble. If he's looking for confirmation from others, I just need other people to tell me they love me. If David was a snowflake, he's in trouble. David, you know what the Bible says? David encouraged himself in the Lord. He learned that I cannot look to other people for my encouragement. If they give you some encouragement, praise God for that. Thank Him for that. But you can't depend on that. That's not where we look to other people, even for approval or encouragement. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 18? It's not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. I'm looking to God for His commendation. I'm looking to God for His approval. And when I have God's approval, I don't need man's approval. If I know God is pleased, I'm not concerned about having men's approval. In Corinth, they were having schisms and divisions in the church over a group. Preachers? Oh, I like Apollos, and I like Peter, and I like Paul, and, and, and they're, they're all dividing over the preachers that came through Corinth. And dividing over personalities of the, of the preachers. And we understand, you're not here to please men, you're here to please God. So if I look inward at myself, I'm going to get depressed. And if I look outward to others, I'm going to get discouraged. You're, going to, you're not going to live the Christian life long. Let me, let me illustrate something for you. How many of you in the room tonight have been saved? You've been a Christian for more than 10 years. Let me see your hand. I think that's most of the people in this room. Okay? Probably 90%. In those 10 years, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have seen another Christian leave the faith? Stop going to church, stop serving God, just leave the faith. Let me see your hands. Put them up. Look at that. It's just about everybody. And that's only 10 years. Hmm? What if you're looking at others? Throw in the towel and say, is it worth it? Hmm? You can't look at others. You have to look to God. And that's number three. You, you, you don't look at yourself. You get discouraged or depressed. You look at others. You get discouraged. Number three, look into the Bible. I'm going to show you something. You're in 2 Corinthians 10. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We read this earlier. I want you to look at it now. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Where Paul wrote, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we look into the Bible. Because the Bible says here, we're looking uh, as like an open face building is in a glass. That's the same reference James gives. How we look into the law of liberty. We're looking into the Bible. You say, well, how do I, you know, I, I wear a bracelet, Pastor. It says WWJD. You don't look to your wrist to see what Jesus would do. You look in the Bible to see what Jesus would do. And if I want to look at Jesus, as Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12 tells me, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, I cannot do that if I don't look in the Bible. And so I look into the Word of God. And as I'm in the Word of God, God begins to change me. You see, the Bible was written for our transformation. When I look into the written Word, I see the living Word, Jesus Christ. When I was in... Bible college just a couple years ago. I heard a preacher quote a poem and I found it and printed it out and I had it in my Bible I carried through college and in the early years of pastoring. It's called, I Find My Lord in the Bible. And it says, I find my Lord in the Bible whenever I chance to look. He is the theme of the Bible, the center and heart of the book. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily fair. Whenever I open my Bible, the Lord of my Bible is there. 
He is the book's beginning. He gave the earth its form. He is the ark of shelter bearing the brunt of the storm. The burning bush of the desert, the budding of Aaron's rod, whenever I look in the Bible, I see the Son of God. The ram upon Mount Moriah, the ladder from earth to sky, the scarlet cord in the window and the serpent lifted high, the smitten rock in the desert, the shepherd with staff and crook, the face of my Lord I discover whenever I open the book. He is the seed of woman, the Savior, virgin born. He is the Son of David, whom men rejected with scorn. His garments of grace and beauty, the stately Aaron deck. Yet, He is the priest forever, for He is Melchizedek. The Lord of eternal glory, whom John the Apostle saw. The light of the golden city, the Lamb without spot or flaw. The bridegroom coming at midnight, for whom His people look. Whenever I open my Bible... I find my Lord in the book. You won't see Him without opening the Bible. Without spending time in God's Word. Jesus is the living Word. That's God in the flesh. And the Bible is the written Word. God in print. You and I hold copies of that tonight. Do you realize what an honor that is? Half the people of the world almost don't have a complete Bible in their language. Realize what a privilege we have to have the written Word of God. And it's the Bible that transforms us, that changes us in the image of Christ. It's, it's, you're not going to be in the Bible. You're not going to spend time in God's Word and invest your time to read it and to study it and to memorize it and to meditate in it without it changing you. The reason so many Christians are so little, that we're so... We're so unchristlike is because we spend so little time with God's word. I'm for I'm for listening to preaching. I, I think it's okay to listen to preaching, and you certainly I'm a preacher. I think it's okay to listen to the radio. We're on the radio, but that won't substitute for your time looking into the glass and letting God change you. The Bible's like in unlike any other book. It transforms your life. It will change you if you'll spend time in God's Word. It wasn't just written for your information. It was written for your transformation. So when Hebrews 12 says, I have to keep looking unto Jesus, then I have to keep looking in the Bible. When you, when you get away from the Bible, you're getting away from looking unto Jesus. And what will happen is you'll start looking at yourself or you'll start looking at others or you'll start looking at the circumstances and you're going to get discouraged. and distur- Every one of you raised your hand and said, yeah, I know somebody who left the faith. You know what? I guarantee you they got their eyes off Jesus Christ. They got away from the Word of God. And they walked away. I didn't know that Margaret would necessarily be here tonight, but uh, I like watching Jim and Margaret Talladega. 53 years of marriage? Is that right? 54? 54 years together. You know what happens? They, they start thinking like each other. Hmm? You can probably finish his sentences. Hmm? You know where she's going when she starts to say something, don't you, Jim? Yeah. Huh? Why? They've been together 54 years. Wouldn't you like to know Jesus like that? You know, the longer you're with someone, the more you get to know them. The more you know what they're thinking. The more you get to be like them and you start looking like each other. I'm not going to say which, which way. We'll just leave it there. But you know what I find out? Is the more you're in the Word of God, the more you spend time with Jesus Christ, the more you'll start looking like Him. We have enough defenders of the faith. I think we need some demonstrators of the faith. Look inward, you'll get depressed. Look outward at others, you'll get discouraged. But you look in the Bible and you'll become a disciple of Jesus Christ.
Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then, you, then ye are my disciples indeed. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't, church, after a great victory like we've experienced, the devil would like nothing more than to get your eyes off Jesus Christ. Don't let that happen. Now more than ever, make sure it's a priority that you'll open God's Word every day and you'll spend time with Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Him. Keep your eyes on Him and you can't do that if you don't keep your eyes in God's Word. Oh, to be like Thee. Oh, to be like Thee. Precious Redeemer, pure as Thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take the truth now this evening. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have your precious word. Forgive us, for often we spend so little time with it. And we wonder why we struggle at being like Christ. Help us to understand the tremendous power that's in Your Word. That it's alive and it's powerful. And it will change us into the same image, the image of Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us as a church family to keep our eyes on Jesus. Oh, we want to run. And we want to run well the race that is set before us. But we desire to keep our eyes on Christ. Help us to do that.